I'm James. I'm 17. And I'm pretty sure I'm a psychopath. School was beneath me, but it was a good place for observation and selection. I had a plan. I was going to kill someone. Working all day with my mind on fire, I can't stop thinking of you. I didn't know where we were going or when I was going to kill them. I punched my dad in the face and stole his car, and that felt like a good place to start. Hello and welcome to Fictional Crimes. My name is Audrey Rupert and I'm your host. I'm a second year LLB student at King's College London and today my guest is Francois Hickel. Hi Francois. Hello, uh, yeah, Francois Hickel. I'm a third year PPR student at King's as well. And today we're going to be covering End of the Effing World. That's how we'll be saying it since this is a school-sponsored project. Um, and if you haven't seen the hit series on Netflix, I highly recommend it. It's extremely interesting, very good television. And we'll be covering two main crimes today, primarily assault and murder. So the first crime we're going to be talking about is assault, and specifically assault with certain types of imitation firearms. The specific scene we're going to be discussing is the one where James and Alyssa, our two protagonists, try and steal some gas. We're not going to go into theft because we went into that last week and it's horrible and annoying for law students to explain. Um, they try to steal some gas and they're about to get caught, so Alyssa is held by the gas station attendant. And then what James does is he hides his hand under his jacket and pretends that it's a weapon and uses that weapon to threaten both the gas station attendant and her employee. So the question is here, is this assault? What would he be charged with and what are the elements at play? So before we get into the individual elements of assault and kind of break it down the technical way like we normally do, I think it's really important to talk about this case that you learn actually in property law, which is called Arn Bentham. Just to note for our U.S. viewers, uh, the crown is represented by R, so that stands for either Rex or Regina. So anytime there's a criminal case, it's called R and. Also, we use V to say and instead of versus. I just thought it might be interesting to explain that to our viewers because we've never done that. Anyways, uh, the most pertinent case here is Arne Bentham. So, Francois, can you explain a bit what happened there? So, in Arne Bentham, the the defendant was doing something very similar as is shown in the show. So, he was trying to rob a man by putting his finger under his jacket and pretending it was a firearm. And they tried to convict him under an offense of possessing an imitation firearm. Can you tell us, Francois, what wound up happening in that case in the end? Um, so in the end, in that case, he didn't get convicted of possessing a firearm because as is established in the law of the UK, you cannot possess parts of your body. So if you cannot possess it, you cannot possess a firearm. Right. Although he did go to jail, I believe, but under a different offense. So last week we kind of went into detail about the mens rea and actus reus of assault and battery. So if you haven't caught up on that, definitely go check that out for more detail. The question is, in this case, whether both the gas station attendant and her employee, Frodo, (laughs) yes, that's his real name, uh, apprehend immediate unlawful violence, as we discussed last week. So what do you think? Do you think she apprehended immediate unlawful violence, or...? I think, at first, she's really doubtful that he does actually have a gun in his pocket, but Mm. when he is asked about the details of the gun and he is able to gave a really detailed description of a gun which he doesn't have, she might start to re- to at least consider that he might have a gun and apprehend him. Yeah, I mean it's possible. We're not really it's not really clear from the show. Uh Frodo seems a bit afraid at first, but then obviously he probably wouldn't press charges because he later also participates in uh keeping the attendant locked in the bathroom. There is definitely a battery here though because Absolutely. they push her into the bathroom and lock it. So I think it's safe to say that he could be convicted for assault and battery. So the main thing we're going to be talking about in today's episode is whether or not James has murdered Clive. We've already talked about the men's and actus rea of murder in other episodes, such as our Game of Thrones episodes. Go ahead and check that out if you haven't. The main focus for us today is going to be whether or not there's any kind of defense to this murder, because obviously Clive, the man who owned the house, was a rapist and murderer himself. So it's questionable whether or not James could be found fully guilty for this. In fact, he even says to Alyssa in the show that they should turn themselves into the police because it's a self-defense case. So we're going to actually break that down and whether or not he'd have any defenses to murder. 
First, we're going to talk about private defense, which is a type of self-defense. There are two limbs to this defense, and the first is the subjective test. So, Francois, can you explain what the subjective test is? Um, yeah, so to fulfill the uh, subjective test, you have to show that the uh, defendant in this case was holding a honest belief that um, the use of force was necessary. Right, and that was set out in R and Gladstone Williams and a friend in Beckford. Um, and of course, this is codified in the Criminal Justice and Immigration Act of 2008. So, Francois, in terms of this limb, do you think that we could show this for James? Do you think he had a honestly held belief that there was a need to use force? So, as we see in, in the show, he, he just watched footage of this man torturing and mm -hmm. killing people. So, you could say he was in a state of mind where he thought that the use of force will have to be... It's absolutely necessary to stop this man, which he believes is very dangerous. Right. Now, an important aspect of this test is that the belief doesn't have to be reasonable, but it must be honest. I think we could argue it's both reasonable and honest. Now, the second limb is the objective test. Francois, can you explain what the objective test is? So this is the second part of the test. Um, so while the, um, the belief need not to be uh, reasonable, the use of force has to be. Right, and this was considered extensively in R. and Martin, and also it's codified in the 2008 Act. So here, I think the argument could go both ways. Obviously, it's up for a jury to decide whether this test has been fulfilled or not. What do you think, Francois? Do you think that uh, he, his use of force was reasonable or not? So I think the character finds himself in a killed or be killed situation, and also he's, a, he's of a frail stature, so he was... Yeah, in a situation where he had to make that decision to avoid getting having his friend killed or having himself killed. Right. I mean, I guess because if you see in the show, he's quite small. Um, he's young, so and he knows that this guy has killed other people before. So perhaps from his perspective, if if he doesn't kill this guy, they're going to get killed first. However, there's another argument to be had that obviously he didn't need to kill him. He could have just stabbed him, you know, or cut his hands or, or legs or something, tried to prevent him from raping Alyssa without necessarily killing him. So it could go either way on that one. I think that's where he might run into trouble. The second possible defense he could use is called public defense. Um, public defense is the use of force in making arrests or preventing a crime. So the defense codified in the uh, Criminal Law Act 1967. Mm -hmm. So the the act accounts for the uh, reasonable use of force in either assisting a lawful arrest or preventing a crime. The crime being prevented would be either rape or murder, and again, it would be left to the jury whether or not his use of force was reasonable. It could go either way, depending on their sensibilities. And finally, the last defense or partial defense that James could use is called loss of self-control. And I think that this one would probably have the highest chance of success. Obviously, his defense attorney should try all of the defenses if possible. Um, but this one, I think, is particularly useful because of the circumstances. So, Ransoy, can you explain this defense a bit? Yes. So, the uh, loss of self-control defense is um, codified in the... Um, Coroners and Justice Act 2009 and has three parts. The first one is that the uh, acts of the defendant have to be a result of his loss of self-control. Right. Okay, so let's walk through each of these three parts. So would we say that James's act is a result of loss of self-control? So as the character is presented in the show, he is presented as a very cold, almost, almost a killer himself. Mm -hmm. So you could say that he did not actually lose his self-control, but that would be to show in court. Yeah, I mean, we have to remember court politics as well. I think his defense could present him as, you know, this young, fragile kid. Remember that nobody but the viewer knows that he had these weird serial killer thoughts at the beginning. I think that it's his best shot because the defense could very easily present, oh, you know, there's this vulnerable kid, he sees his friend being thrown on the bed, oh my god, what's he gonna do? He lost, he lost his mind. Um, so I think they could show that even if it's not necessarily true. The second part is that this loss of self-control had a qualifying trigger. One of them is fear of serious violence against themselves or another identified person. This is an interesting thing. A lot of people think self-defense is about yourself, but actually it could be about yourself or another person. So I think this one's pretty obvious, right? I think it's clearly fulfilled in this case. I mean, obviously, 
he was about to assault Alyssa, potentially kill her. And then also there's this trigger, things must be said or done, which are of an extremely grave character and cause the defendant to have a justifiable sense of being seriously wronged. And I think in this case, um, James just watching the images of this person torturing people could have worked in, under this, this section. Yeah, of course, this section usually applies to things like bar fights, you know, when someone says something mean to you and then you get angry and stab them. Um, but I think you could still apply it to this situation. And to fulfill the uh, last part of the test, you have to show that a person with the uh, defendant's sex and age with a normal degree of tolerance and self-restraint would have reacted in the same way as the defendant. Again, I feel like this could go either way, but what do you think? I think it would be really easy to show in court that for a 17-year-old to be exposed to that kind of Im imagery, every 17-year-old would have acted in that way. Yeah, well, I don't know about everyone, but yeah, I think you could probably show that it would be reasonable for someone to react that way. I think way. there's a case to be made, definitely. So I think it's safe to say that the use of one of these defenses could hopefully reduce the charge from murder to manslaughter for James, assuming that he doesn't act like a complete creep at trial and not gain any sympathy from the jury. Though it should be said that if he manages to use the defense of public defense, that there's a complete acquittal for this, as opposed to a reduction for murder to manslaughter. But if that doesn't work, he could try one of the other two. Okay, that's all for this episode. Once more, I'm your host, Audrey Rupert, and I'm actually going to start closing these episodes by saying where we're from, because I think one of the great things about Kings is how diverse everyone is. Our past two hosts, uh, Christopher Banks, is from Germany and England. Um, our last host, Jakob Mankowski, is from Poland. And Francois? I'm from France. Yep, and I'm American myself. I think it's funny that despite studying English law, very few of us are English. Okay, thanks for joining us. Don't forget to like and subscribe. We hope to see you next time. Thank you for watching.